nothing like the presence of God. Oh, just to be with you. 
So delight in me, delight in me, delight in me, delight, yeah, delight in me, delight in me, delight. Beloved, and he is mine. So come into your garden and take the light in me. Just take the light in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am my beloved, and he is mine. So come into your garden and take the light in me. Take the light in me. Finally found where I belong in Your presence. Finally found where I belong to be with You. Yeah, 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 yeah. I finally found where I belong. I finally found where I belong. We finally found where I belong. There's nothing like Your presence. There's nothing like Your presence. So. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. There's no place I'd rather be. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. Nothing like your presence, Lord. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. And in your presence. All fear is gone in your presence. In your presence is where I belong. In your presence, no, oh, there's nothing like your. All fear is gone in your presence. And in your presence, it's where I belong. In your presence. So we place ourselves in your presence, Lord. From your presence, God, we place ourselves in your presence, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't move from your presence because we finally found where we belong. You, yeah. we finally found where we belong. Presence, we finally found where we belong. Just declare that as we end this today. I finally found, I finally found where I belong. I finally found where I belong in your presence. I finally found where I belong. Just sing it out one more time, declare it over your life. Yeah, I finally found where I belong. I finally found where I belong. Presence, I finally found where I belong is to be with you. So, God, we say we, we finally found where we belong. God, there's no place like your presence. God, there's, there's no feeling like coming to you, 
to your throne and sitting at your feet and leaning back against you and just breathing, breathing you in, God, breathing in your peace, breathing in your joy, God, breathing in your wisdom, Lord. God, we don't just sing it to sing it, God, but we really believe in our hearts, God, there is no place like your presence. Almost like the saying, there's no place like home, but that saying doesn't even compare to your presence. God, there's nothing like your presence. So we say we love you, God. We love your presence. We love the peace it brings our households. We love the peace it brings us at our jobs. We say we love you, we love you, we love you, Lord. There's nothing like your presence. Amen. What a beautiful time of worship we've just had, engaging the presence of God. And we're so glad that you're with us today at midday. If I haven't met you, I'm Tina Davis. I'm one of the pastors here. And I have the very great privilege of having Dr. Trish King with us today and Sydney. We love Sydney. You can wave. With us today in our midday, and this is a special midday, we're doing a table talk, and we kind of gave you a heads up on Sunday, if you were watching our Sunday morning service, that we were going to talk about mental health today during midday. And this is a point on Friday, Pastor Melvin prayed about mental health concerns and issues that were being primarily stirred up during this time of crisis. And so we wanted to just address some of the issues that people are finding in their homes. And as pastors, we've been making phone calls and we're hearing people talk about anxiety and a little bit of depression and just the sense that things aren't quite right. And maybe you are one of those. And so in the next few moments, I'm going to invite you, if you have questions that you would like to engage in our dialogue with us today with Dr. Trish and uh, Sydney and myself, um, would you please put those in the Facebook feed? Sydney and I are going to keep an eye on those and ask them as they're appropriate if we feel like they would fit during this conversation. And one of the things about um, what we're doing at New Life is we have a health team that has been advising us and counseling us on the journey during this coronavirus crisis. And Dr. King is our mental health expert on that panel. So we're so glad to have you with us today, Thank Trish. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. And I know that you have been having all kinds of conversations outside of just new life and our dialogue here. So I think I want to open with this one question. For those who are watching today saying, oh, good. This is my moment. I'm going to learn everything I need to know. In 30 minutes. In 30 minutes or less. Here's the cliff notes. What can we expect to be our takeaway today? You know, as I was praying about this time, I think what was really important to me was that that people know that there is not going to be a quick fix. I mean, we're not even past it yet. And there aren't easy answers. And because of God's creativity, we're all so different that what works for one may not work for all. So I think it's really important, and our hope and our prayer has even been that maybe you take some pearls or nuggets away to help you to process and normalize what has been a catastrophic event in our lives. Some are weathering it better than others. For some, it's been awful. For some, it's been a sheer joy. Their adjustment will come when it's all over and they have to go back. So it's just, I hope in this time that you get some sense of kind of where you're at and and to give yourself some grace. That would be my prayer, that you feel God's grace in the midst of this. Such a great word, grace, right? Isn't that what we ask the Lord for all the time? You said two words that I feel like are opposite words, and so I'm going to ask you to connect them. You said catastrophic and normalize, and those feel like catastrophic and normal don't quite fit in the same world. And I'm wondering if that isn't some of the tension people are feeling. Well, Can you help point. connect those two for me? That is a really excellent point. So, so I use the word catastrophic because this is large. This is global, right? This is beyond 9-11. And it's it's more protracted over time. Sure. So in that sense, I want people to know this is not a blip on the screen. This is a pretty significant event. By the same token, normal should always kind of be in quotation marks because what is normal, right? <laughs> and um, so, 
But in this time of this catastrophic event and crisis, I think it's important that people recognize their normal or what they're used to as their normal may look different, but that doesn't make it any less healthy or helpful to weather this. Oh, that's really good. So normal, we all have to, for once, those who don't ever feel normal, you get to <laughs> redefine it during this season. I think I love this meme. And I, Sydney, after I'm done talking, I'm going to ask you to share a little bit, but I found this meme the other day because I think it speaks of some of the tension people are feeling. Um, it says, home isolation has its ups and downs. One day you're flying high and cleaning the baseboards with a Q-tip, and the next day you're drinking tequila. You're actually having a lot of communion, maybe, I don't know. Um, and watching <laughs> squirrels out the window, and there is no in-between. Right. And that is normal for this time. Our brains, in trauma, our brains can get fractured. I don't know about you guys, but I've even found myself sometimes struggling for my words because the brain becomes so stressed, and depending on how much news and information you're taking in, it can get overwhelmed. And depending on what's happening in your lives, people are losing loved ones and they yeah. can't be together. So depending on what's happening, they're getting overwhelmed. So sometimes the need to distract, squirrel, or the need to, to rest or take time out is really important. But to recognize that some of those shifts that you're doing are totally normal. I mean, some people are saying, you know, I'm taking longer naps just to kind of get away. That's how people are adjusting to this this affront, it's an affront. And I think one of the things is how do we manage that? And you know, after 9-11, they actually found that, that crisis people found that people were watching too much news mm. and it was really making it worse. And so I actually love the news, like it, I'm on it a lot. So I actually now only check it twice a day as a way to kind of help me not overwhelm my mind. So stay maybe shutting it off a little bit. We've talked about that in the context of prayer, like don't distract yourself from your time with the Lord, shut off the news, but also to get your mind calibrated. Yes, yeah. yes, calibration, that's a great word. Yeah. Sydney, one of the reasons we had you come, Sydney works with our youth ministry, our young adults, our kids, our teenagers, and you've had a few questions pop up. I'm wondering if you want to address some of those with Trish. Um, I guess just like the main question, that I wanted to ask you is I know that during this time, um, it's different. This may be the first season that a middle schooler or a high schooler has gone through like this. Um, what signs should parents be looking for that could trigger in their minds that they need, they need to take the next step in terms of concern? Concern, yeah. So, you know, it's kind of interesting because I, I, I have a list in my head that I'll share, but a lot of them kind of shift when you're all in quarantine together. So some of the classic signs, if you're concerned about your adolescent or even pre-adolescent, is a change in the group that they're hanging with, is a change in their dress. So, you know, those groups that they hang with sometimes have different looks. And so looking for a shift in that. Um, change in behavior, change in school performance, and acting out, acting up sorts of things. But now that everybody's home, I don't know about you, but I've been in my sweats a lot. And so dress may not be shifting, and some of those other signs may not be shifting. And I think school's so dramatically different, it would be hard to know, you know, if grades are dropping. I think what I want to say to, to parents is engage your children, especially for adolescents. It, I have been really thinking and praying about them because this is the season they're supposed to want to be with each other yeah. because it's developmental. Because, you know, they're kind of dissing the adults and connecting with their own, right? And that's healthy and that's right. And they can't. And this is not about being extrovert, introvert. This is now about the developmental cycle of connecting with your peer. And so I think it's important parents engage their kids, talk to their kids, and if they're worried about anything, then by all means reach out. I would rather have a parent reach out and be found that there's what's happening is normal than have them not reach out and have something go awry. 
So it's not just even just the pandemic, but it's their normal process of yes. this season of their lives. Yes. And so it's like teasing apart what is correct, what's developmental and what is a response to what's going on around them. I think we got one question from Marty. Thanks. It said, how would parents help? And this goes with the, the students. How do parents prepare their kids to adjust back to normal when things go? So finally, and I think we were talking about this even for adults. Like this morning I was saying to my husband, I'm going to have a hard time getting it all together to go somewhere first thing in the morning. I kind of like the slow roll and get stuck. I don't have, I can wear my robe a little longer, you know. Um, and then getting back into the groove, but they're specifically asking about adolescents. How do you get kids ready to adjust to new normal when we start going back? And I'm glad she used the term new normal because mm -hmm. people have been talking about normal. I don't think what was three months ago is what's going to be six months from now. I think things just like after 9-11, now you can't take anybody to the gate to see them off, right? All post 9-11. So change is going to happen. I think the thing is to talk to the kids because I do think there's some benefits coming out of this. I actually heard today one person saying her daughter was actually glad there wasn't a graduation because she didn't want to put on her gown and walk across the stage. So depending on what the perspective is, and that's huge in crisis, if you don't see a problem, then there's not a problem. If you have a problem, then the perspective is different. So I think it's important that you engage the kids. And what's gonna be really fascinating is not just what do you want to get when it, we're back to our new normal, but what do you want to keep? I'm hearing families that are cooking together, having meals together, and you know what was happening before, that was kind of off the, off the list of options, right? <laughs> so I think some things people are going, oh my gosh, I'm capturing things and having things that are good that I want to keep. So it'd be great to sit down and have a family meeting and say, okay, what do you guys like? Maybe they like game night once a week, right? Sure. Maybe they like eating at home and preparing meals with the family. So it's not only how to work back in, but how to, and I think we're a little premature we don't know what it's going to look like, yeah. so we really can't have that conversation yet because it's going to be a just in time. But we can talk about what we want to take with us out of this. Sure, and so maybe we've been focusing a lot, and naturally so, of what we don't like. This is different, right? Because who likes change? <laughs> well, some people like change a lot, but change is hard. But maybe a perspective shift would be, what about this change have we really liked? Right. And maybe that would bring a piece of mind or a piece of heart to think there are some good takeaways from this time. How oh, that's interesting. And that goes back to the crisis theory, right? That at the end of crisis, I'm at a higher than pre-crisis level of functioning. So I actually take good out of the crisis to then implement later in life, which is, that's, that's healthy, right? That's good. We have a question from Brittany. Um, she says, what are the long-term effects of self-isolation? And what kind of things oh. should we expect to happen as a result of being apart for so long? Oh, Brittany, what a powerful question. The, the short answer is we don't know. We really don't know. Now, we can look back at some things and make some assessments. But one of the things I think I'm most concerned about is post-traumatic stress mm. to people we don't even think about. So we're talking about, yeah, the first responders, but what about the undertakers that are doing, used to doing two services a week and are now are doing two, three, four bodies a day? Mm. So, so we don't know, but I do think isolation is a part of trauma and it is a response to pull back. I think it's really important that we do a lot to engage as best we can. So one of the challenges I'm having is I'm online all the time. I'm either counseling or now it's my social. And I have to fight myself sometimes at the end of a long day counseling people online to say, okay, I really need to connect with somebody and I need to see them, not just hear them on the phone, I need to see them. But it's hard to get on the computer sometimes because I've been there all day and it's tiring. Mm -hmm. But I make myself do it and feel better afterwards because it's so important to stay connected. So self-isolation I don't think has or, or social isolation I don't think has to mean no contact I think we need to find ways to connect and what's fascinating people are home groups are mm -hmm. 
I mean, even self-help groups are, AA, Weight Watchers, all different kinds of people. So I think that's really important. But you know, we don't know what the long-term effects are. We've never been through anything like this. And nobody's alive since the 1918 Spanish flu. So right. how are we going to go back to that? And that was still horse and buggy. So, so much, so much is yet to be seen, really. Sure, and we're redefining connection in, in this yes. time of social Excellent isolation. Uh, we're redefining how people touch, right? Yes. They may not physically touch, but through Zoom or through other ways, there are ways to touch. And I think that has come a long way. That's gone yep. a long way for each one of us, um, whether you're extrovert. I like that you distinguish whether you're extrovert or introvert. Sydney and I were talking a little bit about our spouses you said your wife is kind of enjoying this time, yeah, right? She's an introvert. She's enjoying the fact that we are um, isolated in, in indoors. I am kind of losing my mind. <laughs> Not because I don't want to be around my wife, but just because I'm just used to being around a lot of people. So it's just an adjustment. Me too. And I think that's the catch. See, that's the normal. Some, the crisis is a little kind of fun and easy and, and actually enjoyable. Others, I'm an extrovert too. Uh, I was really glad just to be six feet close to you two today, right? So for, it just depends, and I think that's the catch. Some are enjoying it, and that's okay, and some are really struggling, and that's okay too. It has to do with perspective. You and I, when we, before we came together, we were talking about, you, t you mentioned crisis theory, which is the idea that when you're going through a crisis, it's like the idea is you want, if you're healthy on the other end, you've come up higher, you've gathered some new things, you're finding yes. the positives, and you're saying, in this crisis, I'm going to go with change, but it's going to be a positive change. But we also talked about grief theory, and the idea that some of people's responses, anxiety, depression, that maybe weren't there before, but are peeking out now might have more to do with grief. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm so glad you brought that up because when I did the um, Mental Health Minute, I really was struggling with whether to talk about crisis theory or grief theory. And so um, when there, and, and this is everywhere. Lots of people are talking about this. There are losses. Mm. There are very real losses and none is less than another. The loss of a loved one is a significant loss, for sure. But the loss of graduation or the loss of connection to friends and people is still a loss, right? And it's when we sustain a loss, we need to be able to grieve. And part of grieving is, according to Kubler-Ross, there's five stages. There's other theories, but this is the best known. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Now, I think most of us are out of the denial phase that there really is a pandemic and it really did affect us. Yeah. Um, bargaining kind of, okay, God, I can do this for about a week or two, but not much longer. I'm going to pray an hour every day. If you just lift this thing in about a week, I need to get out of here. Um, uh, uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression. This is something I think people are struggling with. And in grief theory, what's really interesting is if you came to me and said you were struggling with depression, it'll look, grief-related depression looks a lot like major depressive disorder. Mm. So if many of us are in the throes of grieving right now because of this pandemic, then many of us are feeling the sadness, at times the hopelessness, the sleep changes, the eating changes, the mood shifts, we're feeling that. What I want to encourage people is that it's just part of the process. If you're having trouble really coming out of it, or it's more than a day or two, then by all means reach out. But I have days when I'm feeling sad. This is sad. And I have days when I'm overwhelmed with the reality of what's happening. I lived in New York for a, a period of time, and I actually cried when I saw Samaritan Purse putting up a field hospital in Central Park. It just, yeah. it was just kind of shocking. So I think that's okay. And then acceptance of the losses. Some of that acceptance can happen now, but we don't know all the losses we're going to sustain because it's not even over yet. Sure, sure. Somebody was identifying that one of the losses that they're feeling, and I just want to say this out loud, is she said her love language is physical touch. And one of the losses is the inability, especially if you're single or you're home alone. Oh, absolutely. And you can't hug a spouse or a child. And 
this isn't working for you anymore. <laughs> That's a loss. That the it physical is. proximity is it part is. of that grief, isn't it? It is. And when they were talking about we may be away from handshakes now forever, and and I was like, no. <laughs> I like touch. Yeah. No. And to me, that's kind of a nice touch when you don't always want to be in close, right? I was, and, and, and that was a little bit, it threw me. Yeah. yeah. So even just the adjustment of the thought of it, forget yes. the actual exactly. doing of it, but just the idea and having that adjustment can be exactly. a, a difficult shift. Um, I love this, Trish. This is so, so great. And I think, I'd, and maybe you've said this, but I want to make it clear. Maybe the distinction between a situational anxiety or depression is not quite so easy to tease apart from a clinical long term, or is there something that kind of distinguishes like this, these emotions I'm feeling that are not, they, they feel bad, like the anxiety, the depression. Can I tell the difference between something that's been triggered because of the pandemic versus something that might be more chronic? So whether the pandemic triggered it or whether it was something that was there that's been exacerbated or it's just related to the pandemic, I think what, what I'm going to encourage people is if you're finding ups and downs, that's normal. If you're having good days and bad days, that's normal. If you're feeling anxious and a feeling of dread occasionally, that's okay. If you can do things to get yourself out of those places, you're doing well. If it becomes life-altering, you can't work, you can't really get out of bed, you can't focus on anything but those recurring perseverating thoughts that are driving you so crazy and making you anxious. If that's happening, I would encourage people to reach out. Yeah, yeah. I know um, somebody asked if people are doing telehealth, and yes, not only just for yes. medical doctors, but practice, right? Yes, Rafa is doing telemental health, and I flipped the switch right when we started the first week, and people are coming, and it's been great, um, and it's a great way to still process with people and be present to people and help people through their struggles. I think some people actually like it better. Sure. It's a, it feels a little safer sometimes. <laughs> yeah, they're it? in their home. <laughs> yep. Uh, RafaCounselingServices.com is how you can find our Rafa counseling ministry. We're not done talking yet, but I just thought I'd throw that in there right now for people who are asking. Um, that is a partner counseling ministry that New Life is partnering with, and Dr. King and Dr. Cyrus Williams and others are overseeing that, along with the counsel of Pastor Kevin and myself, Pastor Dan, and others, um, and they are offering telemental health, and so you can just go right online and find out. Cindy, do we have any other questions that are popping up? Uh, Pastor Dan wrote in. <laughs> he wrote in. He, he Pastor asked, Dan. Um, do children process grief different than adults? Oh, that's a great question. That's such a great question. Yes, they do. Um, one of the things that's interesting, when a child, and I'm talking usually uh, lower than preteen, when a child is depressed, they don't necessarily present with a sad affect and a kind of psychomotor retarded or slowed down. It's kind of a term for everything kind of gets slower or sluggish. They sometimes will be happy they actually will present sometimes happier. They don't have the affective changes mm, that an adult cha does. They don't have the cognitive process to be able to deal as much with their emotions as adults are supposed to. Um, that's all variable. So in children, you'll, see, you'll still see the changes in behavior and you'll hear sadness. I think what's really important is that we allow them to express their feelings. So if they say they're scared, then I think we need to talk to them about that. If they say they're sad, I think we need to be able to talk to them about that. And if you don't feel comfortable as a parent having those conversations with your children, okay, then find somebody who is and get some support and help with that. And I'm even sure that some of the pastors are having those kinds of talks when you guys reach out, which I think is great. So yeah, it presents different, looks different. The other thing is pay attention to what they're drawing. Ooh. Children's play is their work. So when they are playing, 
COVID-19 and rushing in and putting masks on and taking care of somebody, they're playing out this pandemic we're dealing with. And it's good, it's healthy, it's how they process because again, they don't have the cognitive ability to do it always verbally. So let them play it out and then process it with them after. See what they're drawing. If they're drawing a lot of guns and boys and <laughs> all that sort of thing, you know, how you feeling and talk to them about it. So the play will, is really huge with children, huge. Oh, that's really good. And I think, th if I may add, which I really don't have much to add at all, but I like that these are seasons to introduce new words and new emotions to kids who may have never had to use emotion talk great or point. feeling talk. This is a great teaching time for parents to give words to especially younger kids that never had them before or never had to use certain words. And so I think that's helpful. So this puts a little bit on us as grown-ups and parents to begin to understand really what we're feeling so that we can say it to kids as well. Um, another question. All right, Pastor Nina, she's stirring the pot a little bit. Hi, Pastor Nina. Do you see Pastor Nina's question? You want to go ahead and ask that, Sydney? Mm -hmm. Lord. She says, how do couples deal with opposing views regarding this pandemic. For instance, if one spouse thinks it's not that serious and avoids taking preventative measures like staying at home while the other spouse is trying to implement precautionary measures. Bless you, Pastor Nina. <laughs> this is one of those questions I mentioned early that are not gonna be an easy fix because in essence, what they need is a mediator. And my encouragement would be that that would be somebody in the counseling field. I, I think for me, one of the things that I would encourage the couple to be aware of is I think people are dealing with their stress and this feeling different ways. Some people are thumbing their nose at it and going out and having parties and being social and not wearing masks and because that's how they're dealing with it. I don't get mad at them because that's how they're dealing with it. In some ways, that's denial, yeah. <laughs> you know. But it is gonna be hard because you are trying to stay safe and there's some good wisdom and counsel medically about how to do that. So I think I would express, have a conversation amongst the couple and talk about what's going on? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What's underneath that? Are you angry that you're being so limited? Are you frustrated you have to be in the house all day with us? Because you used to be able to go out to work or I went out to work. Yeah. You know, so what's underneath that and see if we can't process it, but it may take a mediator. Sure. And your opening word was the word grace, right? Grace. And I think this is really tapping into maybe some of our spiritual disciplines too, if we can, with grace and forgiveness and being able to access that a little bit differently during this time because it's such an unknown place and we've not been this way before, um, being able to, to extend a little bit more grace to one another to allow for those differences in responding to this crisis. And you know, it's interesting because I have a brother and sister-in-law living in Romania, which has been kind of scary for me because it's just a different healthcare system and, and they're so far away. And she is to the letter. I mean, she has everything set up at the front door and the shoes and everything's all set up. And my brother's kind of like yeah. easy going. And so they negotiated what she was willing to let go of with him and what he could do to help meet her need for it to be a little more structured and even obsessive to a point. And, it, and so they've negotiated that, which has helped. Oh, that's really good. I know our time is a little bit coming to a close, which is hard because there's so much good stuff here. And here's the good news is we are actually going to be doing a mental health forum on Friday evening, May 1st. I'm gonna talk about that again later at 7 p.m. And we're gonna have a little bit longer time. That's gonna be a discussion. We'll have a few others on the panel um, to talk maybe a little bit deeper into some of these conversations. So what we can't get in today, we'll have other opportunities. But I think there's a couple more questions that maybe we can hit up before I love we the wrap up. Me too. This is, this is not a question on here. This is a, a personal question. Okay. Um, so what are some things that we can do while we are separated and we are um, quarantined. What can we do to kind of do mental 
health check-ins at home. Like the same way you would just because you are separated from uh, the gym, you can still work out at home. Are there certain things that we can do to, I guess, just check in on our mental health while we're at home? You know, that's a really good question. And I think for me, this has been for everybody. So I am not immune to the effects of this virus. So for me, what has helped is I have a few people that I will pick up the phone and say, I'm having a hard time today. I don't know why, but today's been particularly bad. Or I'm a little anxious, you know, I caught the news. Or a few weeks ago, I realized, oh my gosh, according to Northam, we could be doing this another eight weeks. I can't do this another eight weeks. So I picked up the phone and called somebody and said, I just, I think processing, getting it out is huge because when we stuff it and keep it in, that's when it becomes destructive emotionally and physically. So I think it's important to get it out. And I think if you're noticing that you're doing a lot of numbing, so we talked about fragmented, how, you know, your brain kind of gets kind of broken up and can't find your words and there's some things going on. In trauma, one of the other things we do is when we're in pain, our body seeks, pain seeks pleasure. Pain wow. seeks pleasure. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of pain. So where's the pleasure? Well, it's in sugar. It's in drugs. It's in alcohol. It may even be in sex. And so it's to be aware oh, what am I doing, right? Am I, am, how is my eating? How is my drinking? How am I using drugs? How am I using them? To me, Sydney, that would be real telling. What are the things I'm doing to numb that are be, because it's so painful to, that are becoming a problem in and of themselves? Does that make sense? Yes, it's so good. Especially if you weren't doing them before. Especially. Yeah. So when there's the contrast of what you were right. doing before. And someone was asking about addictions. And we are going to definitely talk about addictions at the forum on May 1st. So we're going to probably put a pause on that question. But we're certainly going to hit that up. Um, okay. So the last couple of minutes. I just want to Ooh, say one please, thing about yes. There is no shame. Amen. Good. There is grace. So good. Right now, people are doing what they can and and what they have to do to survive. This is some survival, right? So we're talking basic instincts. And so I realize that we may not want people doing things that are not healthy for them emotionally, spiritually, and physically. But by the same token, if you are struggling with that, please, there's grace. Reach out, try and seek some help. Uh, but no, beat yourself up, don't shame it. People are dealing with this in all sorts of ways. No shame and also a big wide open door to reach out. Amen. I, I think, and this takes it a little bit on the spiritual side, but and we are good at saying, well, I'm the only one dealing with this. And if anyone knew, and the enemy then tacks onto that and says, you're right, right? And so this is that time that if you're really feeling like you're struggling and it's crossing a line that you're not comfortable with or that you know maybe isn't biblically sound or whatever, please reach out. Let somebody know um, because you're not alone. Absolutely not alone. Amen. Amen. Before we close out today's, and again, we're going to have another, more of these because this has been fantastic, Trish. Can you give us three, four, five things that we can do to um, take care of ourselves during this time? What are some good basic practices that we can say, okay, maybe we can't fix it all, but what are some things that we can do to shore up um, our mental health, our emotional well-being during this time? So I don't know how many of you caught, but the astronaut Kelly... Um, actually wrote what it was like to live in the space station for a year. And it was very good. And one of the things he talked about was a schedule. Have a schedule for the day, even Saturdays and Sundays. It shouldn't be rigid. So like if the schedule goes awry because the kids or the internet goes out, whatever, it's okay. But you should have a schedule. So get up, take a shower. This is not a prolonged vacation. So this isn't throw caution to the wind, eat whatever you want like you do on vacation. A schedule will really help, okay? Again, Good. give yourself grace in the schedule. The other thing is I think it's really important to, to moderate your social media and news feed. Mm, so 
because I think sometimes we read social media and go, oh my gosh, I'm not redoing my whole house. I, I, I'm not redecorating. I'm not getting anything done. When in actuality, some are doing that great, but I'm not. And that may not even be what feeds you, right? You have to think about what feeds you. So I think it's important to reach out, find connections, people who you can reach out to, who you can be connected to, and moderate the news and social media feed because we compare. This is not a time to compare. God made us all different all different, which means he has creative ways that we can adapt and learn, that we actually may be able to share with others that could be helpful. And that's another thing I think in those groups is we share, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And then maybe we learn new things and maybe we say, oh, I could never do that. I'm not going to do that. Okay. Yeah. But we're, we're sharing and being honest. So I think we got to watch the news feed. We have to watch the news feed because it just generates all that anxiety. Sure. And there's so much unknown. I mean, really, from day to day. Yep. So those are a couple of things. So helpful. Keep a schedule, some level of a schedule. Right, right. Give yourself grace, but schedule. Watch social media. Watch what you're watching on the news. Be careful for comparisons. Um, Be careful on numbing. Be careful of numbing, so of not feeling anything, and uh, reach out. Stay connected in any way that you can be connected. Do so. Trish, this has been fantastic. And Thank you so much. And our feed is like, can we do this all the time? <laughs> So awesome. Oh, yes. that it blesses me because I really <laughs> believe that what God wanted was to, for people to just know mm. that he loves them and it's okay. It's, it's not fun, but it's okay. He's, he's in charge. It's so good. Well, Trish, I'm going to ask you in a moment to close this out in prayer okay. if you don't mind. So I just want to remind you. So join us for our regular middays this, every day at noon, Sunday, church at 2. But on May 1st, we're going to have a mental health forum at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll get the word out through our social media ways. But we just want to invite you back specifically for these topics. And if you have questions that you want to send in ahead of time, um, and again, we can only go so far in these kind of dialogues, you can email, and I'll get them, and I'll filter them through, at questions at newlife.global questions at newlife.global. That way we can kind of get a feel for what people are looking for so that when we have a dialogue, it's meaning for those uh, who are watching. We're so glad that you're here with us today and we are praying for you. We are expecting that God is going to meet you right where you are, no matter what that looks like in this new normal. He is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And isn't that a fantastic thing to hold on to? Dr. Trish, would you pray us out today? Lord, I thank you and praise you for technology and the ability in this pandemic to reach out and touch people who are in their homes. I pray, Lord, for your grace and your peace, for them to be at peace in the present. Not look to the past, not look to the future, but right now, Lord, just to feel your grace and your love and your acceptance of them. None of this surprised you. It didn't take you by surprise. And therefore, you have things for us that we can do, that we can incorporate, that will help us to weather this storm. I thank you that you are a personal God. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the care and concern of the pastors. I thank you for the opportunity to talk about these things openly. And I ask you to bless all those in their home and who will see this later in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. 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 God bless. We'll see you tomorrow at midday.